Um, do you have any questions about last session? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, hopefully this is quick, but I just wanted to make sure I understand a fully convolutional network. Mm -hmm. and so my question is, um, when they, when you or the paper says uh, you have a kernel that is the same dimension as the input, that means the kernel is the same dimension as the input when you have an input image in your original like image net data set that is just like a, a lower resolution image of a cat. But then when you take this larger image that has like a cat and a dog, then the kernel isn't the size of the input in that case because the input is like larger. Is that, did that make sense to that question? Uh, so I guess you're talking about this part of the network. You are not talking about the original image. Yeah, it, in like- Yes, for this tensor, you have a kernel that is of this size. And maybe we can just say the height and width is like 10 by 10, just for having Let's a number. Let's think of uh, AlexNet or VGG, because they had a fully connected layer at the end, like these layers, they, were, they had to crop their images to a particular size, like 224 by 224. Uh -huh. If your size is 224 by 224, then you're going to end up with a low resolution feature map mm -hmm. at the last convolution. This is the output of your last convolution. Yeah. Now here, you're going to have a kernel that is of this size. Yep. Actually, you're going to have 4,096 kernels, each yep. one having this size. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is the inner product of those kernels and this. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to give you these numbers. It's going to give you four. 1096 numbers and in that case it's only going to be a one by one um like it's only one dimensional in terms of like like it's only a four yes yeah resolution in terms of resolution it's you can think of it as it is one by one by 4096 yeah okay the answer of that size but uh, then the original image now could be of any resolution because we treated this as a convolution as long as it's bigger than the original resolution though. Yes. If it is smaller, you can do padding. Okay. You can do zero padding or same padding or uh, different types of padding. Mm -hmm. Or you do reflection. But yes, you are right. It has to be bigger. And usually our images are bigger in terms of size. And if they are not, we are gonna resize them. But uh, yes, now if this is our original image, we have multiple objects sitting inside it. Now we want to have a segmentation map for the cat and the dog. Mm -hmm. And there is always this trade-off when you want to do semantic segmentation between what and where. We have to shrink the resolution and increase our number of channels because that's going to help us identify what is inside that image. To identify the where, we have to upsample and we have to make sure that we are not losing much of the local information. So it's a balance between the two. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. So last session we covered up until that point. And then we said, now that you have 21 classes that you can identify from, it's time to upsample. And you can do that using a deconvolution. Sometimes they call it convolution with a fractional stride or fractionally strided convolutions or a strided convolution as they are all the same names. You can have deconvolutions and whatever that is, it's nothing but the reverse of the forward and backward passes through a convolution. And we know that we have to backward pass through any convolution, even these ones. And that's gonna be the backward pass is gonna increase the resolution. I'm gonna tell you what these operations are exactly in terms of the mathematics of it, but this is nothing complicated. But uh, so far, when we were doing image classification, we had only one number to say how good our model was, or how good our model is. And that was uh, classification accuracy. So a big part of any machine learning framework is its evaluation. You need to have key performance indicators. You're gonna be able to say, this model is better than the other model. So that's a major part of your uh, deep learning frameworks, whatever that you want to do you need to ask what is your evaluation matrix. So what are the major components in a deep learning framework and machine learning in general? It starts with data, you write a model, 
you can also call this prior data model. You try to model the data, then you write down the loss function. That's very important. Then you do training, and then you have to do evaluation. So evaluation is very important. So whenever you read any papers, ask yourself these five questions. What is the data? What is the model? What is the loss function? What is the training? How do they train their model? What type of optimizer they are using? What type of hyperparameters for the optimizers? And the other one is evaluation metrics. So what is our evaluation metric here? It's going to be pixel accuracy, mean accuracy, mean intersection over union, and frequency weighted intersection over units. So you're going to have a confusion matrix like matrix where the entries, the i and j entry, is going to be the number of pixels of class i that are being predicted to belong to class j. So you're going to count these numbers, but now you have to do it per pixel throughout your entire data set to give you a matrix. And once you have that, you can write down your pixel accuracy, mean accuracy, intersection over union, and frequency weighted intersection. So these are going to be our metrics to compare a model versus the other or to choose our hyperparameters, like how deep our network should be, how wide should it be, et cetera. So is this clear? So this was just a quick recap of what we covered last session. Any questions about the evaluation metrics? Okay, perfect. Let's see how the model is doing. You can have different backbones. You can have AlexNet, you can have VGG16 and GoogleNet. And remember, we are doing transfer learning. So we are cutting our network at some point right after this last layer and uh, the rest of it we are learning and perhaps we are doing some fine tuning on the alex net learned on ImageNet. so we are doing transfer learning here with our backbone being alex net or vgg16 or google net and we are comparing mean intersection over unit so it turns out that vgg16 is doing the best but then when you look at the forward time it's not as efficient as the other two and this is just telling you how deep the networks are, how many parameters they have. This one has the fewest parameters and is a little bit faster, a little bit slower than Alexa. And uh, RF stands for receptive field. That's the receptive field size. I'm going to give you an, a, a precise definition of receptive field in future slides. And this is the maximum stride. It means that uh, if your original image has some height and some width, as its uh, resolution, you're doing a down sampling of 32 after all of these convolutions are done. But then we have to go ahead and try to solve the where of the problem. We sort of solve the what of the problem by going uh, down in terms of the resolution. Now it's time to address the where of the problem. We don't want to lose too much local information. So let's say this is your VGG16, or this is your convolutional neural network. You have your original image. As soon as you push it through a convolution or a couple of convolutions, your resolution is going to go down. When, one, when you push it through another convolution, your resolution is going to go down. And then uh, in the end, that's going to be your resolution. And we said the maximum stride is 32. So you lost uh, 32 in terms of your resolution. So this image is 32 times smaller than the other image and the other tensor. But what you can do now is you do an upsampling using a backward convolution. And this is what we were reporting. These numbers that you see here, they are coming from that route. But to address the where of the problem, you can take the layer before, the output of the layer before, for instance, pool five, pool four, you copy it here, you take the output of convolution seven and you increase the resolution, you upsample it by two, and you're going to get two feature maps that you can concatenate now. Now, to get to the original size of the image, you need to do one upsampling that has 16. So you do 16 times upsampling. You can do a similar thing for your pool three. You just copy and paste it here. You upsample pool four by two. You copy and paste it here, and you upsample convolution seven by four and you copy it here and then you concatenate them and you do a deconvolution layer, which is gonna do eight times of sampling to get the original resolution. So the idea is that there is more local information in pool three compared to pool four and compared to pool five. 
and we want to use that information to help us localize our objects. So what is the effect? If you have only fully connected network with 32 op sampling, that first row, this is what you're gonna get as the outcome of your segmentation. This is the ground truth. So somebody labeled our data and gave us that. Fully connected 16 is gonna give you more details and fully connected uh, network eight is gonna give you even more details. It's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be your ground truth, but it's actually not bad. So that's a way of dealing with the local information and the wear of the object. And how do you compare these? How do they compare to each other in terms of pixel accuracy, mean accuracy, mean intersection over union and frequency weighted intersection union? The fully connected network, fully convolutional network with eight of sampling, which is this one, is giving you the best result regardless of the metrics. And let's see some failure cases for the network for instance, here, you are not able to identify those cars. And maybe it has to do because it has to do something with those objects being very small. So the scale matters. Uh, we can also look at this one. It's a boat and uh, with sign. These are not human. These are just life vests. And the network is identifying them as human. So that's another failure case of the network. So whenever you write a good paper, you need to brag about your results and at the same time show the failure cases. And that's why this paper is really good because they are being honest. And uh, we can apply the method on the Pascal VOC 2011. These are actually when they submitted their method for the competition. And these are the results that they're getting on the competition. And that's the inference. Then. Any questions before I move to the next one? Yeah, so these um, sort of upsampled uh, fully connected 32, 16, and 8, they're not combined, right? Those are just different things they tried. Uh, actually, FCN16 has two branches, so it has both of them. And FCN8 has all three of these. Okay, so they are combined at the, at the very end, like yeah. in some way. Yeah. Cool. And just to make sure the so when you have the like two times COM7 and the four times, that means you're using that exact same layer uh, to do your deconvolution, right? Exactly. So you're taking tool three, you bring it here, but now they have to have the same resolution. You bring tool four, but then you have to upsample it for it to have the same resolution as tool three. And because our strides are two, these uh, cells are going to merge into one. So you need to upsample by two to get the resolution of tool three. And, and do you upsample by deconvolution or just interpolation? And you can actually do a bilinear interpolation. Okay, I have a question about how they're producing the the 16x and 8x upsampled predictions from the the pooling layers and the upsampled pooling and convolutional layers in the network. So you are not sure about this part, yes? Right. Are they averaging the pixels before upsampling, or is that part of the upsampling process? So what you can do is take this feature map. The problem is that they are not showing the channel. So you're going to have a couple of channels. You're going to have a bunch of other channels for con 7 You concatenate them. Now you're going to have a tensor that has this size for its resolution and a bunch of channels. Now you can do a deconvolution on that. OK. Same thing here. You do a deconvolution on this. So they're being concatenated by channel. I see. Yes. OK, thanks. And because you want to concatenate, they need to have the same resolution. Otherwise, you can't concatenate channel-wise. Any other questions? Okay, perfect.